we're going to have a conversation up here about building um, new education inf innovations and what the infrastructure for that might look like now and into the future. All three of our panelists have been... Oh, great. Okay. All three of our panelists have been very deeply involved in building new education innovations, albeit from rather different starting points and with different organizational perspectives. So um, Vicki Phillips represents the philanthropic sector. She's been building a large-scale public infrastructure that's explicitly optimized for the school system, which she'll tell us about. Ronaldo Lemos um, comes from the public slash academic sector, as well as being a Brazilian TV star. He's been working on uh, building public, both, but this is very interesting. Um, Ronaldo has a range of experiences, which he'll tell us about, but he has an incredibly unique perspective on the fact that he's been working with really large public infrastructures, as well as incredibly tiny grassroots infrastructures, none of which were initially intended for education, but have ultimately become really critical sites of non-formal learning. And so I think his story is, is fascinating, and I'm really looking forward to learning more about it. Um, hello? <laughs> uh, Leslie, uh, not uh, last, but certainly not least, is, uh, comes from the private sector from a game company called Valve um, that has built a large-scale private in infrastructure that started explicitly for gamers and is now being turned towards the question of education. And I think she has some exciting news to tell us about what's going on there. So despite their differences, these three panelists, I think, well, we'll discover, share uh, a common belief that I think is very essential to building um, a new infrastructure, which is that building innovation requires attention to both the technical and the social. And I think often in the 21st century when we talk about education technology from the 20th century or digital learning in the 21st century, we forget that it's not about the technology alone. And it's really, really important that it is very much still about the people and about the people, people's behaviors, activities, and practices. So. Um, just a quick, let's get everybody on the same page. What do we mean by infrastructure? Well, it's one of those words that means everything and nothing at the same time, but as a starting point, um, infrastructure typically refers to the technical or the organizational structures that support a society. Roads, electrical grids, telecommunications, and or that pr um, produce and provide societal services like education and health. Um, this morning, we're going to dig into what it means to build an infrastructure around education, and especially an infrastructure that today is no longer strictly about brick and mortar buildings, but about bandwidth, as well as hardware, software, and peopleware. Um, infrastructure that may not be targeted for or constrained to reforming schools, as in the past, but in fact seeking to connect or bridge schools to transform learning, and may or may not depend on public monies alone, or perhaps not even at all to deliver what has traditionally been considered a public service. So there's a really important transitional moment in what infrastructure in this sector means, as well as what innovation means. So with that, I'm going to back off and stop talking and let the much more intelligent and eloquent folks at this table take us away for the Saturday morning. So let's begin with um, a brief introduction by each of you. I will keep you at four minutes to the best of my ability, and then we will let the games begin. Vicki. You want us to talk about <clears throat> the piece that we're working on specifically? Just a brief introduction of yourself, and then we'll come back, and I'm going to ask each of you a, a okay. kickoff question, and then we'll go into our dinner conversation, okay. or breakfast conversation. I can do this in a lot less than four minutes. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I'm Vicki Phillips. I'm the director of the College Ready Strategy at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. I come at that work having been a teacher, um, a two-time superintendent, uh, a chief state school officer, and also having run a small foundation and a little bit of work at the national level along the way. So I've spent most of my career walking back and forth between uh, policy and practice and hoping that uh, one can more um, eloquently inform the other than sometimes happens in this country. Um, but probably the most important thing is I also come at this from um, a student perspective having grown up in a really rural, high poverty area with no expectations for uh, college or what I would do after I left um, high school. So 
Um, it's that experience probably as much as anything that has shaped my passion for this work and my desire to make sure that kids across this country get um, a high quality education not by luck like I did but by design and that we create the kind of more accessible opportunities for that to happen. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here, Diana. Um, in spite of the fact that I had to fly 16 hours to get here from Brazil. Uh, I work in a center, I direct a center in Brazil that is called Center for Technology and Society. We do a lot of research about the appropriation of technology, especially by places and communities where you wouldn't expect technology to be appropriated. So for instance, the Brazilian shanty towns or favelas, and also in Latin America as well, so Colombia, Mexico, and Argentina, we did a lot of work there. And what really strikes our, our work is how technology is actually becoming this uh, accidental infrastructure for education, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And just to give you a little bit more about me, I was last year in Princeton uh, doing research about information technology policy, and I'll be back there next year as well for a course. And I would like to give you a, a pr perspective about the challenges of education also from uh, the Brazilian and Latin American challenges a as a whole and how the social component can actually be sometimes even more important than the tech infrastructure itself. So let's talk. So I'm Leslie Redd and I'm the Director of Educational Programs at Valve, although we don't really have titles at Valve, but I told them I needed to make one up so that when I was in such auspicious uh, audiences such as this one that you would take me seriously. <laughs> so I actually spent seven years as an administrator at, uh, at an independent school in Seattle. Spent a lot of time with kids and around teachers and other administrators and helped run the school. Before that I did public policy and management working for University of Washington, uh, Smithsonian, and was able to see different infrastructures both crumble, going over to Hungary and the Czech Republic after the wall came down and trying to work with public administration educators over there and seeing how one had to rebuild those. Um, it was a little bit of a happy accident that I fell into Valve um, and what ended up, the reason why we have thrown our hat into the educational ring is back in June, Gabe Newell, our our co-founder and president spoke at the Games for Change Festival. And he ruminated on what's in a, what is the difference between a commercial and an educational game? What are the differences? There was a lot of, a, of interest from foundations, universities, educators, government agencies about why we were even thinking about this and where we wanted to go with it. So in September, we actually took steps to go forward in figuring out how we would be able to sort of redeploy some of, the, some of the assets that we had. And when we went public with this announcement, and I encourage you to go to learnwithportals.com, we heard from about a thousand individuals who wanted to be involved with our effort, half of which were educators. And one of the things that Valve does, as any of you who are part of uh, our Steam subscriber, and we have 40 million users around the world, over 1,500 games. I see Sylvia likes that. <laughs> over 1,500 games. You can access our digital distribution platform um, in uh, 100, over 120 countries, localized in 22 languages. So we're pretty big. We already have a really big infrastructure. So we're trying to figure out where we want to go from there. Great. So you've got a sense, as I said, this is a, a very diverse panel with um, really interesting backgrounds and different perspectives. So I'm going to start diving into some of the specifics that each of you do. And Vicki, let's, let's start with you. So y'all, I have these new glasses that are really having, I'm having trouble with. <laughs> um, the Gates Foundation is placing an enormous bet on the new infrastructure, the, the, the shared learning collaborative. And many might say that such an infrastructure is really the realm and the responsibility of the f federal government. You know? so, so why is Gates stepping up to do this? Tell, I mean, tell the audience a little bit about what SLC is. And then why is it that this is what Gates should be doing and, and not US DOE or some other branch of the federal government? Sure. So um, <clears throat> let me tell you what 
SLC, which is called, it's the Shared Learning Collaborative, is sort of designed to do, and then I'll back up and tell you a few reasons why, and, um, and then address also why philanthropy. So the Shared Learning Collaborative is um, a, a portal, or a, think of it as kind of a big app store for teachers, ultimately. And we're actually designing it with nine states across the country who came together and said, you know, we are all about to embark on this journey where each of us as a state wants to create an infrastructure that our teachers can use to find high quality products and, and materials aligned to the Common Core standards. And each of those states had money in their budgets in order to be able to do that. And what they found when they started coming together was that they were each going to duplicate efforts as we so often do in this country. And each were going to design that on their own. And as they started to come together and have a conversation, decided that it might be more productive if they did it as a collaborative. So I want to come back to that in a moment. <clears throat> the collaborative itself is, as I said, you think about it ultimately as kind of a big app store that teachers can go in and find um, curriculum materials, supports, games, next generation kinds of assessments, new kinds of courses, innovative professional development uh, opportunities, all aligned to the Common Core standards, all developed by people like you and these across the country, and the portal just allows them to access those. But it's also um, powerful because it has a data layer that allows us to get smart across the country about uh, what materials and things work with kids and what work with what kids and what teachers and what classrooms so that we can actually have a more performance driven um, market out there. And it has a set of learning maps that are tied to the Common Core standards. So a teacher could literally go in and say, I'm teaching eighth grade X and I want to find the, some of the best of what's out there that I know absolutely is high quality aligned to the standards and also to make it more affordable and accessible. So some things might be free, some things might be for fee, but because these nine states represent 11 million kids, they make the marketplace easier to enter into for both designers on one end and teachers on the other end um, to be able to, to find things. So that's the goal, is to create that kind of portal. And the reason we stepped up to that was that these nine states were literally going to use their dollars to replicate this nine different times in a way that may not ultimately have even talked to each other. Um, and because those states have such high technology needs that they could take much of their dollars and move it to those other needs so that ultimately we get more of the technology needs uh, across the country met. And given, um, you know, who we are and how we think about technology, it became easier for us, joined by the Carnegie Foundation, to create the portal, um, to do it in a contract where it's non-proprietary, so it's not an owned thing by anyone, so no one gets to, you know, resell it, that sort of thing. It's a non-proprietary open system that um, many more states, if they choose to, and only if they choose to, can sign up to once it um, gets developed. For us, it became powerful for a number of reasons. So one is certainly the efficiency reason, right? That we're using uh, one-time dollars more productively and allowing states to shift their dollars to other kinds of technology needs. But it's a, there's a whole other set of things that were very important to us as a foundation. One is we are, as we've evolved our agenda over the last few years, we've got teachers really front and center of everything we do. So we've been listening to teachers, we've been researching with them, we've been co-designing, um, or they've been co-designing with our partners out there that we're investing in, in new materials and games and other things aligned um, to the core. So this notion of putting teachers front and center putting great materials in their hands and giving them more power over the decision making of those is a very important piece for us. And as we listen to teachers, we did a survey of 40,000 teachers uh, two years ago and then we've been surveying a smaller portion of them for the last couple of years and 95% of the teachers say that digital resources engage their kids more and 93% of them say they help them achieve student outcomes more powerfully and that they want more of that. In fact, only 6% of the teachers that we surveyed said textbooks could do either one of those things and strongly agreed that textbooks were powerful. So teachers are wanting this, they are asking for it and um, 
we've been committed to creating with a lot of partners out there uh, better tools, higher quality, and more affordable and accessible, and needing a place to start to put those, as well as understanding that there's a lot of people like you out there developing great things that teachers should access more readily. Um, and the, the third thing I think is that we wanted to have a more robust, higher quality market in this country, period, for teachers, education market, particularly aimed at teachers in, um, because if you think about what happens in education, because everything is local and you have 15,000 school districts across this country, part of what happens is that really innovative entrepreneurs who are trying to get into the education business don't have a level playing field because they have to go, you know, sort of sell stuff one off to everybody. And one of the things we were hoping that we could help enable as a foundation is an opportunity for a more level playing field so that everybody has um, better uh, opportunity to design things, to get them into the field, to have them tested against high quality and standards, but if they meet that, then to have them far more accessible uh, to teachers across this country than they've ever been. And then the last thing I would say, and we can come back to some of the other issues, um, you know, we want a more performance driven um, piece, but the last thing is just that if teachers are really the most important factor in schools, and that doesn't mean schools as we know them now, but even if you think of the conversation that John Seeley Brown had this week about the changing role of teachers, even if you think of teachers in a changed role, they just continue to be critically important in this work. And putting them more at the, as the anchor of some of the decisions um, seems to us to be a more powerful place for us to be than some of the current kind of bureaucratic ways that we uh, handle things in education now. Whether you think about teachers in traditional schools or charter schools or blended models or online as coaches, facilitators, however you think of them at this point. And so for us, it wasn't a case of government versus non-government. It was a case of how do you leverage both sets of funds? How do you leverage state funds to do some of the other technology pieces that really need to be done if we as philanthropy could come together in a one-time way and build out this base um, infrastructure and allow anyone who wants access to it over time to have that kind of access. So for us, it was a matter of leveraging dollars, not substituting one for the other. Great. So it's a, we'll come back to this and the audience I'm sure will ask you questions, but it, it, it's actually really interesting and on the one hand when I hear about shared learning collaborative I think these are, this is, you know, I used to work in the office of cyber infrastructure so I hear these words and I think this is a big old school style technical infrastructure and yet it's actually not about making schools run faster and cheaper, it's really about the end user and making teaching and learning more effective which is super exciting. Um, so that's great. So Leslie, um, Valve is a game company <laughs> and uh, one that has built an incredibly powerful technical platform as well as really, really potent um, social game communities. And so you have, you bring to this, to this world, you really do sort of epitomize the notion of a technical and social infrastructure, but one that's not been optimized at all for our sector, which brings challenges and opportunities. So tell us a little bit about, I think it's probably too early to tell us about what you've experienced, but maybe you can tell us about what you aspire to here and how you think this is going to play out. Right. And what I'd like to do is actually, um, it's a really good segue from some of Vicky's comments because, um, so we are actually riffing straight from the teacher. Within a game community or as um, JSB mentioned the other day, the participatory culture is that a gamer as an individual has a unique relationship, an incredibly engaged one with the game and the community around it. And the, the level of that engagement and, and depth of participation is truly stunning in many different ways. Um, so what we heard when we said, okay, we want to have something to do with this, but we're not sure what it is, but we know this is important and that we want to support students and teachers and parents. And by the way, we did not think of going through the school system at first. That, that seemed a little daunting. And we were going to go straight to the student and the parent because we interact as a community with our the person who plays our games and is part of that community. But what we heard after September was, I am using 
portal, portal or portal two in the classroom. And by the way, those of you who don't know, this is a title, um, one of our titles, which is runs on a physics edge and has actually quite a lot of physics, problem solving, spatial reasoning, persistence, all sorts of really interesting puzzle-like, um, the whole thing is a puzzle, and having to go through different levels where you're constantly learning how to be successful. And playing portal makes you feel smart. That's what we hear again and again. So we heard from teachers. I am using Portal in my classroom. I want to use Portal in my classroom. How do I use Portal in my classroom? And how do I find content? So basically at Valve, you hear from your community. You sit down. You say, OK, how can we now meet these needs? So we recognized there were a couple of different things that we needed to do. And we needed to be true to the culture of the game community. We are not educators, and we do not pretend to be. However, as we've been hearing about game designers, actually know a lot about educating people. Um, and educating people is the same as educating students. So what we ended up doing is, OK, how are we going to distribute this? We have this really large digital distribution platform. Any of you who are Steam subscribers know that you can't necessarily have a 10-year-old pull that up in their classroom. Um, there's a little bit of problem with firewalls, um, the technology that some of these that the schools have. And I actually have a little list of challenges and opportunities um, and the challenge is the experience that we've had has been very interesting thus far. So what we're doing is we're, we basically are going to have a, um, a version of Steam that will meet all the system functionalities and requirements that a school needs to pay attention to. So a student will be, will be able to get into, into this version of Steam and then they will not be able to get out someplace they shouldn't go, just to Leslie, state can it Can I just way. ask you to, yeah. maybe for the, some people in the audience, could you maybe just say a little bit about what Steam is yeah, so and for non-gamers? Yes, thank you, sorry. <laughs> So Steam is a digital distribution platform. It's, it's subscription-based. You can you install the, the Steam client as a, um, um, and that's free. And then you're able to purchase, play, download games and tools as well. Um, you can think of it, and please don't quote me anybody, as the iTunes of video games. <laughs> But that's sort of the, sort of the simplest way to Great. think about how that is. Very there are games that are free to play. There are games that are 99 cents, and there are games that are 69.99. So, and we do not create all of those games. There are over 1,500 games, and most of those are partnerships. And most any game you can think of, except for the gamers in the room, that one particular one, which is not on Steam right now. Um, we have pretty much every game you can think of, and this runs mo on console and mostly PC and Mac. Does that help? Yep. Diana? Okay. Um, see now, the, the months that I've been in the game community, even I forget to explain these things. So how are we going to help get some of these games, these um, assets, these tools into the schools? And the other thing that really encouraged us to do this is that we're coming out with um, a new authoring tool, a new level editor, which for the non-gamers in the room, and this is for Portal 2, it is a way for you to modify, to mod the maps in the game Portal. And anybody can go to Think with Portals, and there are a couple screenshots, but we've just gone into the beta, um, and into a closed beta, and this is going to be something that will be incredibly useful and helpful for students and for teachers, for, for anybody. But we saw the potential of it from an educational point of view, of being able to have that user, the student, the consumer, also become the creator and the producer and have to use systems thinking skills, have to iterate again and again, um, and to be able to either demonstrate some knowledge, demonstrate mastery of a concept, something like that. So, OK, we're good. we know how to get Portal 2. And by the way, it's probably going to be an educational version. We think it's a little mean to give an entire game that a school may not be able to run and put it into a classroom. So we're going to come up with an educational version that will be scaffolded for the teacher and the students so that they would be able to understand the character development, the storyline, how the assets and the tools are used, the different pacing of the game, um, and other things like that. OK, we're going to be able to distribute it. And we're going to be able to put it through the pipeline in an appropriate way. 
where's the community? So we're creating that framework. So we should be coming out soon with Teach With Portals. And Teach With Portals, if you go there now, there's nothing there. But there will be. <laughs> it's on our server. And Teach With Portals is the place. So this is a public access website. And this is the place where anybody will be able to go and see content. Now, who's going to create that content? Not me. Oh, Sylvia's going to. Absolutely. A lot of people in this room might. And you're going to create the content using the authoring tool and using Portal 2. And then you're going to download it. And then we'll figure out how we'll suss out which is good and which isn't, and which is useful and which isn't. One of the things that we're doing is we are seeding the site with some teacher's work. We actually, the, ex the thing that I'm so excited about in the last couple days is the other night I actually sent the key, the, uh, the ability for a group of 18 teachers around the country in a diversity of schools. So diverse socioeconomic, geographic, uh, public, independent, rural, urban, and we sent them access to use this authoring tool and, uh, and the whole game of Portal 2. And we're really excited to see. They've been waiting for it for months, and I keep telling them it's coming. And so we're really excited to see what's going to happen with this. And I actually checked our forum this morning. And that's the other part of this, is that you have to give these communities a place to talk about this. But we also recognize that teachers need a way to to not be flamed by their students and not to have any random person in there making comments. So we're also going to have, it's a private forum for teachers for them to be able to talk about. Great. So I just want to uh, reflect back on something that I heard Connie say yesterday in the panel, which was, you know, she raised the question about scale. And I, I'm not going to ask you guys to answer this, but I, I want to test a thought with you and you can, and when we get to Q&A or to the, to the conversation part of this, you can maybe return to it. But it seems to me that um, you both are talking about very large scale platforms. We are in the era of the platform, both in education and in, in, in uh, consumer facing products as well. And it seems to me that done correctly in the way that you guys are also describing it, that these large scale infrastructures actually might enable smaller scale, lower risk, context-based experimentation. Is that, is that a fair way to think about it? And great. So that sort of addresses how um, we're moving from what might have been considered old school infrastructure to more agile types of development that characterize the 21st century. I think that's an important transition to underscore. So, Ronaldo, I'm not even going to possibly try to say the name of your university because I will do a terrible job. But it, I think it's really important that we've heard now here in the U.S., just as two examples, um, the philanthropic and private sector investing and building new infrastructure for, for education. And we had a conversation yesterday at lunch where the public sector is leading hard, at least financially, into innovation and, and education in Brazil. And, um, at, at quite a price point, which I will let you reveal, I will not reveal. Um, and I just wanted to know if you could tell us a little bit about what is the vision, how, how is it conceived, what are the challenges? Tell us a little bit about something as interesting as the lawn houses and then also about Overmundo and how these sites that were more about social inclusion and non-formal learning are really take, starting to take precedent. Yeah. Uh, so basically, if you think about Brazil, 190 million people, uh, it's a big country, uh, and now still struggling with the digital divide. And basically, there are two things that are happening that I think it's very important. So from the perspective of the bottom of the pyramid, there is this fantastic phenomenon called the, the land houses. Land houses, they stand for local area networks. They're like cyber cafes that were basically created for people to play games, and they became like so widespread in the country that now there are more than 100,000 land houses in the country, as opposed, for instance, to 5,000 public libraries or 2,000 movie theaters. You have like 100,000 land houses. That's almost half of the number of schools. Brazil has about 200,000 schools going on right now and you have like one land house for every two schools. So basically, they are cyber cafes created for games, and then the internet connection got there. So basically, people go there, pay 25 cents of a dollar to use the computer for one hour, and it was a huge accidental program 
that didn't have anything to do with the government, that actually created this platform where people could go and do not only their own personal business, but also like do schoolwork, uh, research, and use the internet for various purposes. So what happens when an expect, uh, unexpected program like that happens in a country like Brazil? Moral panic. People didn't know what to do with the land houses, so basically they started creating all these restrictions and regulations. They were completely crazy. So, for instance, my favorite one is the one that prohibited land houses from being set up less than one mile from a school, which is completely crazy because schools are precisely the places where you need land houses the most. And actually, in a city like Rio de Janeiro, where I live, there would be only two places where you could have a land house, in the middle of the sea and in the middle of a forest that we have there. <laughs> and so this is the, the types of work that we started like researching to show people like how positive land houses had become and how these regulations had to be revoked. So after three years working with that, we actually managed to work with the, the state government and revoke many of these regulations. So now there is this positive feeling about the land houses. And it's fascinating how spontaneous work between schools and land houses started to happen. So one of the things that we learned is about this idea of tangential learning that actually games, even if they are not educational games, they can, they can be used for educational purposes. And one of the projects that we are actually developing is how you translate the motivation that is actually uh, led by the games themselves into the school system, because if there is one thing that is lacking in Brazil, and I guess everywhere, is motivation for the students. So games get kids really motivated, and the, the issue now is how do you play, even if the game is not an educational game, how do you use that sort of excitement in, into the school system? So, so that's one of the things that we've been working with several land house owners in order to create a system of not really a currency, but a sort of a badge that you can translate into the, the two uh, different worlds. And another very interesting thing that is going on is the fact that uh, there's a lot of excitement about education as a whole, and then it's worth to talk a little bit about the government in Brazil. So there's a sort of a gold rush between uh, international companies getting into Brazil. So now you have Pearson, you have Harper Collins, you have like a, the Santillana Prisa group from Europe. Uh, everybody's basically going to Brazil because there's a lot of things that are going on. And interestingly, uh, last year, the government released uh, a bid for proposals in order to build textbooks for the next three years. And for the first time, the government is focusing on digital materials. And the, the size of this uh, bid is actually $700 million. But when you look at the, the procurement documents and the, 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 the bid proposals, it's very funny because a sort of retro mania seems to have uh, taken over the government because they are requesting people to produce DVD ROMs, like if you were in the 90s or something, <laughs> but with worse music that is not so good, actually. <laughs> um, so it's very funny because uh, it's, it's, it looks to me like a missed opportunity because it's a lot of money going to the system, but there is no consideration whatsoever about the methodology, the indexing of the materials, the collaborative possibilities that uh, uh, an initiative like that can raise. So like, how do you build materials that are all the time enhanced and uh, changed and uh, modified by the community? And there's no thought about the platform and there is no conversation about licensing. So how are these materials going to be licensed? How can they be appropriated and reappropriated? So uh, this is one of the things that I'm working with right now, and I'm about to write an article. And it's uh, an interesting call because you have both Brazilian companies and consortiums of Brazilian and international companies running for this bid. It's open until May. 2012. So when you think about these two things happening, the conclusion is basically what you need the most is ideas. 
you already have the infrastructure in place uh, in land houses and cell phones everywhere in Brazil. I, I told you that there is 190 million people and there is like 210 million cell phones in Brazil. And the basic approach of schools to cell phones is keep them off. Uh, and of course, there might be other better approaches than simply turn your cell phones uh, off during school. And this is something that is also need to change. So basically, uh, I always think about Jimmy Wales when he talked about Wikipedia and he basically said, Wikipedia is not really uh, a technological innovation, it's a social innovation. So when I see it in Brazil, I definitely feel that we are really desperate for new ideas because we already have the tech into place and actually what we really need now, we have the money into place, which is also extremely important. And what we are looking for now is ideas and how to connect the dots between the different worlds. It's super interesting. I mean, just to tie this back to some of what JSB talked about yesterday, and, and if you think about it, you actually have more innovation here on the, on the edge, in the yep. lawn houses, and, and you're, it's actually a demonstration of what I think we've been talking about in this community now yep. and referring to as connected learning. I mean, you're actually achieving that, and yet your government, with all due respect, is spending an exorbitant amount of money to take you backwards. Yep. Um, so. Interesting what that core might learn from your edge, and hopefully you'll be able to bridge those things. But you also helped, Ronaldo, bring me to one of the questions I wanted to open up to the panel. Clay Shirky has a very famous quote, at least um, amongst those of us who read him, which is a very broad audience. Revolution doesn't happen when society adopts new technologies. It happens when society adopts new behaviors. So. Again, I really want to get back to this point so that we, we understand that while you're building large-scale tech-enabled platforms or lighter weight, mobile-enabled, you know, communities, it seems to me that, you know, we are not going to see any real innovation in education until we see changes in the social practices and the dynamics between people and, and the definitions of those organizations. So how do you see... I'll open this up to, to any and all of you. How do you see what you're doing leading to that? And is that where you're headed? So one of the things I also want to mention, which I forgot to do, is that um, for our purposes, this is going to be free. So the Steam as being able to install it is free, but we will be giving this educational version of Portal 2 and the authoring tool for free. Um, and anything that we put through the pipeline that comes from Valve will probably be free as well. So I think what we're going to do, try to do, is I guess we're going to try to shake things up a little bit. That we are a grassroots, I don't want to say use too big a word, but um, to, we're a grassroots effort. It's going to be teacher to teacher. It's, we're hearing from the teachers who are the gamers, and as more teachers retire, you will have more of those pretty much digital natives moving into these teaching positions. And at the same time, we're hearing from teachers who are so eager and desperate to engage and support their students that they send us emails like, I don't know what you do, I don't know what it's all about, but my students said I had to email you. And so we want to be able to offer that to them. I would say from the collaborative and other and some other perspectives including ours that part of what we're trying to that we are trying to turn things on their head in terms of if you think about demand because um, teachers your example is perfect and it's the same thing that happens in this country right now if you think about where decisions about curriculum resources are made they're made in what for a long time worked really effectively a set of you know, curriculum groups, adoption processes at the state level that, um, you know, have all kinds of rules and regulations underneath them or down at a district level. Um, rarely have they been in the direct hands of teachers. And I think what's happening now is digital resources are going to become so prevalent and so accessible that it allows individual teachers or collectives of teachers to make those decisions directly for themselves as opposed to having all of these layers of 
You know, so one question for all of us becomes, and we don't have the answer to this, but we think we'd better be thinking hard about it and headed in that direction is, yeah, how do you t change those processes? How do you put the dollars attached to both professional development and curriculum and instruction materials far more in the hands of teachers directly? How do you help teachers do that individually but not lose the collective power of teachers coming together and analyzing work and those kinds of things? And how do you put teachers in the driver's seat of them telling us, meaning us that are out there that are the designers, what they need and us helping respond to that as opposed to what large-scale efforts have done in the past, which is, well, we'll build what we think you need, teachers, and we'll just have a big force that puts it out there because we just have the connections and the networks. And I think we think that there's room for lots of people to be producing high-quality materials and supports. Um, you know, when Bill Gates talks about this, he talks about the fact that we don't leave doctors alone in their offices to invent new equipment, new medicines, new everything. There's a big industry sitting underneath them. And why shouldn't teachers have that too? Why shouldn't teachers have a big access to a big industry that gives them what they need to be successful when they step in the classroom, however you define classroom, but also puts them in the driver's seat of um, making those choices that are appropriate for them and their kids. And then how do you do that in a way that still make sure that what they get access to is of high quality and has some data and performance indicators underneath it so we know it actually works to get outcomes for kids. So all of these things are just big tensions and dilemmas right now that there aren't ready answers to but that we'd better be struggling with because we can see it all sitting sure. you know, in this room. Sure. So I just want to push you a little bit on this. Sure. So it's it's a it is a huge gap right now, as you as you rightly noted in the school system, you know those who procure are not those who teach and learn, right? So we know that, and so I'm thrilled that SLC will will bring that you know that the supply and demand, to, uh, to use your words, um, closer down to the teacher herself or himself. But what about the parents and the kids? You know, when, when do we get to an infrastructure that helps them make those decisions or empowers them to make those decisions? So, I mean, in, in the world of the SLC, the school system as we know it remains the infrastructure for the delivery of education with a, a, technical la a technology layer. Is that fair to say? Or? Um, I think we're, we're certainly starting from a perspective that we want teachers in schools to be able to access this, but our view of school is much different than that in terms of what's possible because you know we're also investing in, we just put out a challenge for another round of blended models of school so that we think about school differently. I also think that if you think about what we'll set up on the SLC, there may be very well be a big r array of student mm -hmm. supports as well and supports that like the games and other things like I, not not sitting on it but being accessed through it that um, can be used in school out of school even the courses that um, a number of our partners are working on that are more uh, both blended and some fully digital are being done in modules where kids and teachers could take them apart and they could be done in school and out of school and I think the other tension and dilemma for this in our country, I don't know if this is the same for you, is this whole issue of right now kids get credit by seat time. How do we move to, and I know people were talking about badging and other things here, how do we move to credit by proficiency? So there are a number of policies that need to change, but I do think the opportunity exists here for us to think about this in both ways, right? For kids and teachers. Um, the parent piece, I think, is, is a tougher one in terms of how we, um, truly open all that up and make it accessible as well. But I think all of what we're talking about here has great implications for all three right. populations. So, Ronaldo, tell us a little bit. Um, I know I, I, I just want to push on this Overmundo example because I really think it's an incredibly important example of what happened really grassroots outside of the school system and became a phenomenal, is a phenomenal non formal learning site. And I think there's a lot of interest in this audience for that type of Yeah, absolutely. So this started like in 2006. Overmundo is a platform for the dissemination of culture in Brazil. And it's interesting because it was br built by the community itself. So one of the problems that you had in Brazil is that if you were living like in Sao Paulo and Rio, you would only see news 
about what was going on in Sao Paulo and Rio. And even if you lived like in, a, in the countryside, you also would only see what was going on in Sao Paulo and Rio. Even like the local newspapers in distant cities, they wouldn't talk about what was going on there locally. So basically, this was created as a sort of a hyper-local platform. And it actually demonstrated the appetite for the Brazilian society as a whole for innovative uh, processes. So this is one of the things that I, I find important, which is uh, the issue of the parents. Parents, they see technology in Brazil as a positive thing. They want their kids to be close to computers and even to video games. So basically, uh, I think, Overmundo actually demonstrated the viability of putting together even projects like uh, based on culture and education, because if you put them in place, they find their own audience very quickly. And actually, one of the things uh, that we are trying to raise uh, now in Brazil is a change of mentality, because for instance, a lot of schools, they have computer, computer labs, and they basically keep them locked because they see the computers as very expensive, so they don't want them to be broken or anything like that. And I always uh, try to re remind people of the work of people like, for instance, Sugata Mitra in India, which had this project called Hole in the Wall, where he would basically put the computer there and don't say anything and just let the kids there for three months to try to play with it and see what comes out of them. And it actually he f had very interesting findings because there was a lot of learning, exploratory learning just by the contact with the computers. And this is something that I think uh, needs to change. So for instance, in this uh, procurement process that I told you, the DVD-ROMs, they cannot have executable files like .exe exe, because they say oh, this might harm your computer and that's bad. So we, we basically will see a lot of flash in these pro products and that's actually a very important concern because you know there could be so much more diversity in terms of programming and platforms and actually I really think we need to scale the thinking uh, a little bit up and think more about licensing platforms, indexing, uh, standards, and these are the things that are actually have a, a very significant impact over the, the how you build uh, educational infrastructure. And one last example is about the tablets. So the Brazilian government is in a sort of a post-PC kind of mentality now, and they want to buy 600,000. they they're still in the DVD-ROM. Yeah. yeah, and then yeah. we were talking at lunch, how do you insert a DVD-ROM on a tablet? <laughs> and like, uh, <laughs> so basically that's a very hard uh, problem to solve actually. And uh, so the point is, what is going to happen? You're just going to give the tablets to the students with no thinking about how they're going to be used right. and not even a connection with the digital content that we are going to produce. Yeah. So, as I said, we are definitely needing a lot of good ideas at this time, yeah. That, that's actually a really excellent point. There's a, 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 a long road, long history of failures of education technology in this country and certainly in others. And largely, in my humble opinion, it's been based that failure is largely because people just assumed you throw technology over the fence and everything will change. It's like, it's like magic, you know? <laughs> you put a computer in the back of the classroom and the world is a wholly different place. So that is really important around both SLC and something like STEAM and Portal in, in the classroom. You know, professional development, behavior change, it doesn't happen overnight. So how, how, do you, how are you thinking about those issues? We're looking to you. <laughs> but seriously, we, um, we think it will be in the beginnings. Um, I mean, this is, this is a really interesting um, road for us to go down and to think about, and we're thinking about it not just, obviously there's the more formal professional development that could evolve from this, and we hope that the teachers who have been most involved in this program will do that that we may be able to enable and support them, but I'm not gonna go out and train anybody. Um, we want it to be teacher to teacher at the same time because we're providing this framework. This is not just for schools. 
This is for after school clubs like the Boys and Girls Club. This is, or, um, or the TAF Academy in, um, outside of Seattle. This is for homeschool groups. This is for any group of people who feel that this is something from which they can benefit. And so what I would predict is we're going to organically have these the same way you end up with the experts in any type of game community, you're going to end up with those mentors and coaches and advisors doing the same thing within mm -hmm. this. And we just have to make sure that as we get this information back from the community of this is what we need, that we're able to provide sort of the technical and behavioral um, infrastructure for that. Right. So, um I mean, um, among the things we're trying to do is invest in a number of new kind of innovative professional development models and to see, again, working with teachers what works best for them. Uh, if you saw one of the panels yesterday, you probably heard Karina Wong talk about some of the math and literacy tools we're developing in a site for teachers that are working on that where they can come together and um, work collectively. We've been investing in something called um, the Teaching Channel. If you haven't seen the Teaching Channel yet, which is... Um, uh, much like what Britain's Teachers TV was uh, years ago, or not years ago, actually just up until a few years ago when government changed because it was primarily government funded there. Here we're trying to make it more of an independent distribution platform for great examples of high quality teaching and you know shorter and longer videos and trying to both um, help people recognize and understand the complexity and the power of teaching these days, but also mostly use it as a professional development platform um, to help teachers see great videos of practice. I mean, I think one of the powerful things we have in our country right now, and you alluded to the need in yours, is the fact that 44 states have adopted Common Core standards, because it really does open up a whole new world of possibilities around um, sharing of practice across the country in ways that we haven't done before, and technology enables that. So things like the teaching channel, things like the simulation work that the University of Central Florida is doing. I mean, there's lots of new things out there that we need to figure out how to get, again, more in the hands of, of teachers. And we're, we're quite frankly looking for, as, as you said, lots of new ideas in that regard, of both how do you increase the personalization and learning velocity of teachers in the same way we want to uh, increase the learning velocity of kids, but how do you do that in a way where we can have individual and collective opportunities? Because that collective collaboration, as you know, is hugely powerful as well. Don't have all the answers. Looking for great ideas and starting to invest in those. Um, as well as do, you know, professional development attached to some of the specific tools that our partners are, are designing. Uh, very quickly, uh, from our perspective, what we've been doing is basically work with regulations. So basically trying to strike everything that is basically inconsistent with this use of technology in schools. This is something we've been working directly with the government. And also changing, uh, for instance, doing a lot of empirical research. So once you have the technology widespread, a lot of interesting things come out of it. So you want to go out to the field and see what's actually going on and see if you learn from the experiences that showed up there spontaneously. And this is something we've been doing for the past three or four years and you actually find out very exciting things. And also developing pilot projects. So basically we've been working with the World Bank uh, now to develop a research infrastructure on top of the land houses. We are basically going to create a sort of a, a polling system. So a person goes to the land house and she can actually use the computer for free for one hour if she answers a, a poll. And we are going to use that to assess, for instance, educational levels. We are going to use that to assess like uh, public services and so on. So really understanding the, that the, infra the technology infrastructure is already there. And the fact that sometimes uh, assembling technology and created tech projects is actually uh, something easy to do. I, I, th I liked one of the panels that I saw yesterday. I think it was Mitch Kapoor. He was saying about the lean innovator, uh, about like basically building 
incremental solutions on top of uh, already existing uh, technology and standards. That is something that is so doable. It's something that is completely possible to do. It's more like how do you put these different parts together, experiment with them, see what works and what does not, and then you try to scale. This is also an approach that we, we are developing in Brazil. Great. I'd like to open it up to questions and uh, great. If you have a question, please come to the mic in the, in the center. Hi, my name is uh, Nicole de George and I'm here from the user experience information architecture software design community. And I care about education and I was here last year and I'm so psyched to see how many people are here. And um, so I'm not an educator, but I want to do anything that I can to be part of this change because I think our future, the future of this country matters so much and for our kids and teachers. Um, and I wanted to get your opinion because it seems to me, you know, in, in our world, you know, we have user experience designers that advocate for the users. And so it seems to me that schools, if um, a new position in schools could be created at the administrative level or, you know, at the school level because we have all this large-scale infrastructure yet we need schools need this customized solutions if there was uh, someone that you could interface with at schools that would be advocating for the teachers and the students that could also communicate with them in their own language about how this technology could help them and kind of be that person that's I mean that's what I do for a living for businesses so for me I'm thinking you know, could this be a good solution for schools? I, I yes, that, and I, I don't know if that makes sense. No, it, <laughs> it, it, it makes a tremendous amount of sense, and I think a sense, and I think it is a layer that has traditionally been absent in this sector, and one that that as we move into new these new worlds in which you know there will be technology that is direct to the teacher and hopefully direct to the student and becomes more mobile, and these are the kinds of interface talent that we need at the school level for sure. There's, well, no there's a lot of us out there. So. I know. We need to tap you. We need to tap you for sure. Um, hi, I'm Rachel Bryan from the Big Picture Learning. Uh, and I was really encouraged by sort of seeing ideas of the many to many that was talked about yesterday and how the lawn houses and um, students being able to alter the games and become the designers and more teachers being in charge of curriculum. So that's really encouraging to me. Um, I do have a question about the SLC because it seems like using Common Core as the way to evaluate whether stuff gets on there sort of flies in the face of that five-year half-life that JLB was talking about with, with uh, you know, are those the skills forever or are those the skills, at what point does a student have to do the remix and is Common Core able to, to be a part of that? Um, as a math teacher, I have to say I love the Common Core habits of mind, but when I look at the list of things that are on there, uh, it makes me think about how our curriculum is a mile wide and an inch deep. So I, I throw that out there because of what Ronaldo said about um, kids playing games that were not educational had a positive outcome for those kids. So they didn't, they were not standards based and yet learning happened and positive things happened and I think about Sedlicek and non-cognitive variables. And so I guess my question is, are there other ways to evaluate gaming or learning interactions that could be positive without necessarily saying like, yes, on the standards, that's, because there's a lot of other things that go on that make a student successful that are not part of Common Core. Yeah, I think without doubt there are other things. And um, I think the Common Core and the SLC is just a great starting place because it gives us an unprecedented opportunity, right, to share practice. I think over time the standards will continue to evolve, right, as we get new evidence, uh, like many other countries evolve theirs as they go. But I think starting from that core um, opens up an opportunity that we've never had in this country and building off that gives us a really powerful base. And then I think there has to continue to be these conversations around what how does the common core evolve over time what other things are out there I mean we're not trying for the SLC to be everything to everybody and so you know one other thing that's happening that's um, I think very powerful right now is the fact that being uh, Google and Yahoo have come together and are creating a common tagging system so that they will all use a common tagging system that will actually bring education um, 
related materials and stuff up faster when teachers start to search for them. So we're not in, intending for the SLC to be the total universe either, right? And But we are starting from the core as this magnificent opportunity. Quick follow-up, because I, I do see that that's important. I wonder, would you ever consider having some part of that portal have other types of base because I sort of feel like when I work with teachers all the time, things that are not part of Common Core are really being pushed to the side. So collaboration, creativity, having the, the ability to fail so that you could learn something else, it, it, it is um, marginalized within the education community at this point. And I wonder if there might be a, a place for, so if you want to do Common Core, you have it, but then there may be other types of things that build in more like resilient learners or creative problem solving or. Yeah, I think what's interesting is that some of the new, some of the people out there that are developing new courses, new games, new other things are actually tackling some of that in the context of yeah. core content. I and I think that is what is powerful, is when those two things start to come together. So you'll probably see us hold pretty steady to, to Common Core has to be there, but, but whether you can get at those other things using the core's content, I think the literacy work that's going on right now is a really powerful example of that because science teachers are using it, history teachers are using it, others are using it and not having a problem driving their own content. We also have in some of the courses that are getting designed, really art and music really front and center along with the kind of the literacy elements of the Common Core. So I think we're gonna find people do some really creative things with that and with the issue of effort and tenacity like some of the games yeah. produce. And actually I'm going to bring this all together now because we have, in the template that we've created um, for the, um, for, be, for individuals to be able to upload curriculum to submit content and lesson plans, we have a line that says standards met. And we are encouraging the National Science Frameworks and then the standards and the Common Core. And we have a teacher who we're working with from the Bellevue Big Picture School who is an English teacher who feels that through using Portal 2 and this authoring tool will be, is able to use um, it within their English classroom to, um, to be able to adhere to certain common core standards. I'm going to just take moderator privilege for one second and you will certainly be able to grab the mic in a second. So I just want to... I really appreciate what you both are doing. I want to be very clear, but I feel like the com that what we're talking about is building an infrastructure for schooling and not learning. And I want to push us again, all of us, to think hard about how do we build that larger infrastructure that really supports the vision of connected learning. I mean, Leslie, you have that opportunity. You are taking something that is from outside the school and bringing it inside school. How do you think about that? And you know, and I guess that you know, also forces the question of, is the infrastructure of the future an infrastructure that supports schools or an, an institutional public service around schools as we've known them today but driven by technology? Or is the infrastructure of the future something that really supports personal practice across a multiple set of, of locations in their uh, kids' life? And you know, I'm gonna reveal my, my bias. You know, my bias is towards the latter, and I think that might be the bias of a lot of people in the room. So how, how do we deal with that? Yeah. Especially in a world where, you know, we're building, you know, SLC is a big infrastructure, and we are in a world of agile development and rapid development. So how, how does this all fit together for the future? Just pushing us all a little bit. I think just simply for us is these are just where we're getting our toes wet. And I think that we will... Watch, and, watch carefully and engage with purpose and intent to see where the community brings us. And so I think that's what's going to be so fascinating about this, is that we actually were brought in the direction of the educators because they asked for it. So we're engaging and working within the construct of the, the school and the physical building and how that works. I think that going down the road, when you think about the fact that a platform like STEAM has uh, social networking opportunities, it has achievements, you can extrapolate out what could be possible. Right. This is a really important piece because the teachers asked from our conversation and from what I understand from teachers, teachers asked for this not because it supported Common Core standards but because it taught a different set of skills that they valued. And the risk is if you start to modify your offering to meet all of the demands of this one institution, you might water down your value proposition. Just a thought. Yeah, I think, <laughs> but I think you, I think you 
thinking about it as an either or is, I, I just think that's not the right way we should be thinking about it. I think we should be thinking about it as a more fully developed system that does both. I mean, right now we still have a lot of institutions and schools and we still have a lot of kids sitting there who really need access and don't get access. We also need to start to push this more personalized learning 24 seven, anytime, anywhere. And to me, there's no reason why we can't be about both. I mean, think, I think a great example right now a great example right now is Khan Academy, right? So Khan Academy has four million users anytime, anywhere, and has a set of, I mean, whether you agree with them or not, right? They also have a set of pilots going on inside schools to figure out how you use it in the current institution. So I just don't think it's an either or. I think we can put our heads and deliver where kids sit now and push this larger piece and that that's the way we should be thinking about this. I couldn't this. agree more. I, and I knew that you thought that I just I wanted know, you to articulate that. So that's that the good <laughs> thing about stuff like this is Excellent. we get to go for it. So the last thing I want to say is don't think of SLC as a infrastructure that's wires and think I mean I feel like we're thinking about it as some kind of infrastructure that's a big you know massive technology platform it is a portal through which teachers will be able to go out and grab lots of things including stuff that you've developed stuff that from commercial publishers to entrepreneurs that are just getting their toes wet and getting some good outcomes but it will tell us if those things should stay up there because it will have data behind it about whether outcomes for kids are changing so it's not a kind of traditional technology platform infrastructure. It is, think of it like a big app store where you get to go in and make choices against good information that sits there and to get some alignment against some things that we care about now and that may shift over time, but that are a great starting point. Excellent. This is, this is actually a great follow-up to that. Uh, my name is Jonathan Dugan. Uh, my specific question is about uh, changing behaviors. We've used this word learner a lot in the last three days. Um, but if you look at the very highest levels of learning, if you look at medical school training, they have this phrase, um, learn one, do one, teach one. And they make teaching an integral part of their curriculum. In my own experience, uh, teaching has been highly effective at mastery. Stuff I thought I knew, once I teach it, I, it brings it to a whole another level. And while it clearly doesn't work at very early education in the first grade, um, we're, we're pushing this idea of, of one-to-many teaching out to many-to-many. -many. And so the, the question I just want to put out to the panel is, what are the challenges of changing learning behavior so that we can include teaching as part of the learning process um, around ideas like, how does the social structure work? Because if we have one teacher and 28 students, it's kind of a one-to-many still, or even Khan Academy. It's still, it's still the teacher and everyone else sitting behind the screen as the learner. Um, and also things like teaching materials. Like, do we need totally different materials if we're working in a world where the process of learning involves also teaching? So uh, an example I would use of that, because I, I don't totally have an answer to that at all, but I will s say that you know, one of the things we've been, so we're investing in lots of different groups and watching lots of different people's work, but one of the things I think was interesting is um, many of you in here may know Zoran Popovich's work, and we've been making some investments in Refractions, which is a game that's coming online soon. But before that, one of the things Zoran was doing was Folded, which I think is a really interesting example here where he basically took a group of interested but amateur, and John Seeley Brown, I think, talked yeah. about this, took a group of interesting but amateur people, got them to start to fold DNA online, and, and over time made them so expert that they solved a problem that scientists had not been able to solve in like 15 years. That's really powerful, right? So how do I... I I think the question is right, and how do we figure out how to do more of that? Um, and I think, again, uh, John Seeley Brown talked about this a little bit, too. I think it's an important thing for us not to lose sight of that this, you know, the thing that we've traditionally thought of as teaching isn't quite anymore, and we have to think about new roles for adults and new roles for adolescents. And um, one of the most powerful things I see in schools right now, because schools really 
you know, some of them look like they used to, but some of them don't anymore. And, you know, we kind of need to honor that that change is occurring and keep pushing that. And one of the things I see a lot of in schools now is teachers acting more as facilitators and kids in collaborative groups really solving things for themselves. Um, one thing I'd love you to do is get on uh, the teaching channel and watch this um, little video called My Favorite No. It's kind of a great example of what's starting to happen in a different way. Uh, not with high levels of technology, you won't see that. But in other places where you see high levels of technology, you'll see it occurring too. But I think it's an important question. I don't, we, we would say at the Gates Foundation, we by no means have the answers to any of this stuff, mm -hmm. which is why we're out there trying to work so collaboratively with people like you to help figure some of these things out. Can I just have a quick follow up? Uh, basically, very quickly from the experience we have there in Brazil. I have a friend who has a very hard uh, sentence when he describes the land houses. He says, uh, it's easier to transform a land house into a school than to transform a school into a school. So basically, <laughs> I, I don't really agree with that that much, but I think it raises a few very interesting points because it raises our attention to the fact that we need learning to be more collaborative, we need it to be more peer-to-peer -peer learning, just like it happens in land houses. We need textbooks to be approached as a sort of a modding uh, mentality, from a modding mentality, just the way the kids approach games uh, as mods, like they create their own versions of games, they participate in game making, and there are games crafted precisely for your kids to build upon them. And I, I think like these uh, things that we actually see in practice in the land houses actually give some reason to this friend of mine, even if it's not 100% reason. Before you ask your question, I just, we have I think six or seven questioners, so short, and if you could maybe target it to one of the panelists. Yes, uh, my name is Ben Konek with M2 Teach, and my question is uh, on this reimagination of education. I'd like to challenge the media giants to create a hackerspace, so the News Corps, the Microsoft, and Apple, because they have the resources. They know how digital media really at the highest level, so they can coach and mentor these teachers. So a physical hackerspace, not really a school, but a hybrid school. So the struggling teacher who really wants to stay in teacher can stay a teacher. She can come in and someone can volunteer their time from Apple to, uh, I just think there's a missed opportunity there that, and there's a ton of money available for something like that, but the, the limited resources to keep that teacher in STEM in the minority areas is so key. So that's my main point and I, I hope to see some improvements and challenge you to go forward to do that. Hi, I'm Jason. I like education and technology. <laughs> um, so, Ronaldo, my question to you is, um, I remember back in the day uh, reading in Abraham Lincoln's journal that if he knew his opponent in a court trial better than he knew his own side, he'd win. And so I think most people, if not everyone in here, is on the side of getting technology into schools. But I was wondering, just to better understand where Brazil is coming from, if you could passionately defend it like you were you were the purchaser in charge of the Brazilian government for education. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me what's going on. Yeah. That's a the, good role for you, Ronaldo. Yeah, well, oh my god. Uh, basically, it's interesting because we actually have a new minister of education. He was appointed like a couple of weeks ago, and he is listening. He's a person that used to be the minister of science and technology. So basically, I think there's a lot of possibility that actually the criticism that is being raised here and by me and by a lot of people, we will actually get through the government and we will actually perform some changes in the way the things are going. But what I like about your question is about the other side. So we're like defending and saying that technology is good and so on. So what are the challenges? So what is the downside of it? And actually, the downside is basically the risk of destabilizing the educational system as we know it. And so basically, if you introduce technology in a way that is not very well thought and coordinated, 
this is an actual risk. You can actually get something that is between nowhere, and that is uh, actually a problem. But the other problem that I see is that, that the educational system is already being disrupted by technology right now. So the problem is, the way it is right now, technology in Brazil, for instance, is seen as the enemy from the day-to-day -day perspective. So when kids get into class, they are told to turn off their cell phones, no computers, nothing at all. And actually, this is a problem because there's a generation gap. Uh, young kids, they can text with their phones under the table. So this is actually a very interesting te uh, text to, uh, test to see which generation you belong to. If you t can text under the table and with your cell phones inside your jacket, then you probably uh, know what I'm talking about. And so basically, this is the issue that I'm saying. It's already being disrupted. So how do you want this disruption to happen? In a coordinated, well-thought, experimental way, or just like uh, with stones being thrown from the outside? I think that, that's the question. Thank you. Thanks. That was great. I cannot text under the table. <laughs> Hi, my name is Sam Dyson, and I work with DML Initiatives in Chicago. I was a physics teacher in high school for 10 years and then moved into working in the central office administration where I uh, discovered the important role of principals in the schooling ecosystem. Uh, and since you were trying to make an effort to reach into that ecosystem, which I take to be different than the learning ecosystem um, that we've been talking about. Um, but I wonder whether you're thinking about engaging principals as important members of the learning community that transform schools into places of learning, especially given that um, in Chicago and perhaps elsewhere, principals really are seen as the CEOs of their schools and need to be equipped to make good decisions about this stuff just as teachers do. So um, one of the things, the real heartwarming things that we're seeing is that I, we are starting to have not just these individual teachers, but these groups from different schools and wanting to be part of whatever movement that we have going on in whatever program. So for instance, from one particular school in New Jersey, we not only have the physics teacher involved, but we have their tech supervisor and we have the principal. All of the things that that probably the teacher is going to need to do in terms of opening up a firewall and bringing it and bringing our our program into the classroom, they're going to need to go to their principal. So we have spent some time talking to the different tech supervisors, um, all the IT folks and principals, um, and also equipping, trying to equip the teachers with an FAQ of, okay, this is what you can bring to your principal because this is something that what I have been hearing from principals is that they also want to take some risk in this, and they also want to try out all sorts of new innovative ways to engage the students. So absolutely, they're incredibly important people to make sure that they're part, that they're part of whatever effort that we're going to be doing. I think it's important for you to engage them in their current role as chief compliance officers um, and, and get them to be chief leaders. So. So my name is Chris Drew, um, and uh, I've been a teacher for over 10 years now. I'm an entrepreneur, and um, one of the things that uh, my sisters and I, when we started uh, our, our current organization, um, we saw this uh, sort of um, neglect. We're talking about infrastructure, and one of the things I don't hear a lot about is how parents are an existing infrastructure. Um, for example, in the United States, because somebody used the quote earlier, um, revolution doesn't happen when you introduce new technologies, but when people adapt new behaviors. And one of the behaviors that, uh, you know, for example, the U.S. Department of Education says that fewer than 33% of U.S. parents are reading to their nine-month-old children. Mm -hmm. Fewer than 39% uh, are reading to their four-year-olds. And so I'm just curious to hear from you guys um, how you view parents as a part of infrastructure, or if you do, because I haven't really heard. I mean, there's been sort of nods towards parents, but not explicitly addressed. So how do you guys view parents as part of an infrastructure, or do you at all? So very quickly, uh, the way that I see it, as I mentioned, like 
parents, at least in Brazil, they are very favorable to technology. They want their kids to get exposed to it. And actually, they want to share also responsibility with schools. So basically, sometimes parents, they do not know what to do with like the way their kids use technology. They don't know, for instance, how many hours of video games per week they should uh, be playing or, or things like that. And so I think there is an opportunity here for the involvement of parents and schools, because this is actually a way of sharing responsibility also in the education of the kids. What should be the role of technology in their lives? What are the limits? And I think these are things that can be actually worked simultaneously by parents and the schools. Because some parents, they simply don't know what to do, and then they just say, well, whatever happens is good. And some other parents just try to limit technology that much. And I think this is actually a shared responsibility. So there's a, an opportunity of a dialogue between parents and schools, and I think both parts can actually gain a lot from it. Well, just from our perspective, we um, think we have a lot to learn in this country about how to figure out um, how to have parents be equal partners at that table. Um, but to, this will answer kind of both questions really quickly. On principals and parents, we do think that they are both hugely important. As investors, we've put a lot of our focus more on teachers at the moment because we have other partners that are helping invest in principals and the parent pieces so that when you kind of add it together where you start to get the whole, but um, not enough work in this country yet on how we bring, um, how we bring parents into the equation period, let alone how we do, how we use technology to figure out how to do that better um, in stronger ways. So I think we have a lot to learn and a lot to think about in terms of how to do that. And maybe a lot to learn from other countries. Hopefully this isn't controversial to say, but you know, the parents are the first and most important educators that a child will ever have. Yeah. And there are actually solutions out there, Text for Baby, our organization, but um, okay. anyway. Excellent. Well, well, we'll love to hear more about your organization, yes. for sure. And I just think it's important. We heard yesterday on the panel, and I just think, you know, there's an enormous role for parents to be participants, not monitors in this process. And I think, you know, we've got a lot to work to do. Go ahead. Hello, uh, my name is Rudy Blanco. I uh, teach ninth and 10th grade, um, special education and general education, global history and algebra in New York City. Um, now, it's been my experience that when students are introduced to games that are labeled as edutainment um, or games that are blatantly academic, um, it holds few or almost no entertainment value uh, for my kids. And at the high school level, I, again, I teach in an inner city uh, underprivileged school, um, and at the high school level, um, games with entertainment and covert educational values seem to promote uh, more interaction. It's as if from where I'm coming from, there's a sense of having to unfortunately trick my kids into learning until they realize, oh, this can actually be fun. So I guess taking that into account, my question is directed to you, Leslie, or if anyone else on the panel can also add, that would be great. Um, how would you say infrastructure builders and um, I guess game designers can, uh, are using real-time gaming, marketing, sales, playtime data um, from the big, I guess, entertainment companies, um, how would you use that data to help inform the games that I guess we want to develop? And also, could we consider maybe um, overlaying common core standards on pre-existing popular games that kids are already playing, um, and then maybe planning around those games as opposed to taking the common cores and building from the ground up. So I'm curious to know what information maybe so you can provide. That was a really long question. Could Sorry. you do a shorter answer? Because we have five minutes and two questions left. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that was a great so, question, though. So as you may or may not know, Portal 2 is a critically acclaimed, commercially successful game. It's a real game. We're going to give them just a shortened version of it. It's, it is a real game. The A lot of the learning can come around the authoring tool, where we are actually what we're just going to do is expose some of the math that we hide. So there's a lot of math in games, and we're going to expose some of it, and then that will help in the classroom. Um, I think that the kids will come to this because it is real, um, and it's some, not something that has been created to help them learn. They're not shooting it at you know fractions right. wandering around <laughs> a space. They know that that's fake. They have the biggest BS detectors ever, and they know what we're up to. Um, 
At the same time, th bringing up data is really, really interesting because one of the things that we're really looking forward to is that, and we have to figure out how to go about this, but the accounts that we're giving are going to be anonymous and we won't know anything about the kids, but we're gonna have a huge amount of data and we're really hoping that some fabulous research can happen about what kids are actually learning from using our games and our tools. And you know what? If they don't learn anything, we wanna know that. And if they do, we wanna know that also. So we're really looking forward to what that's gonna look like. Our perspective is that I think there are great partners out there like MacArthur or some of the other people that we're investing with that are trying to get at exactly that in addition to these guys. How do you create games that have the kind of educational pathway in it we want and also have that uh, that understanding that how to engage kids and keep them playing and, and keep them um, in the center of it that has the entertainment. So I do think there's a new generation coming yeah. that's going to do just that. Yeah. Hi. Hi, I'm Bernadette. Bernadette Adams Yates. Um, I come from a world where the predominant question still seems to be, is technology effective? So where I've been blown away here by all the ways that technology is being uh, used for learning, I'm not seeing a lot of um, examples of how technology is being used to gather evidence. So my question is a sh short but probably loaded question. How do you know it works? So in your case, um, the, you're, you had said you have a data um, a level of data yes. collection that you're using. And Ronaldo, you talked about like the land houses and the research you're doing there. I just, I just, it's, it's a short question, but it's something that's very much on our minds. It's the, it's the right question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I think it is one of the reasons that as we build the shared learning uh, collaborative, that that data layer is hugely important, right? That it will be large enough and robust enough not personalized, right, no privacy, but large enough to be able to aggregate and say what, what things are working with what groups of kids under what circumstances and to make that widely known and available so that when a teacher goes in, they can actually see, right, where this, this game or this assessment or this new course has been effective and where it hasn't and make better informed decisions as a result of it. I'm just going to problematize your really poignant question and say that there's... Um, a lot of work being done to gather data and to, to develop the systems to gather the data and analytics to, to test the technology. I, that's not a minor challenge by, by any means, but I, I think the bigger question in, in many people's minds is what are the questions we're asking? What's our definition of effective? And that, as we look forward, is, is a, a critical question to answer. So, I, I just want to bring this to the industry point of view that it we, we know that we can't find enough people to hire who are programmers and animators and artists and level designers, and we're bringing them in from around the world. And so these are skills and talents that we need to have as sort of homegrown. Um, and we, globally, we want everybody to be able to access some of these skills. And so at the end of the day, asking, does it work? It, 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 Maybe in a traditional sense, and I don't know this because we'll all do the research and we'll find out, maybe in a traditional sense, it may not work, and I'm putting a lot of, <laughs> but at the same time, it is these students and individuals and young adults will gather so many necessary STEM-inspired and 21st century skills that they have got to have to be able to have productive and healthy lives. What's your tagline, Vicki? <laughs> Right. I also think this is a place where we're going to learn so much from the gaming community that the, you know, the ability of games to turn around data really rapidly is something that, you know, uh, as we think about assessment in education and kind of the next generation of how we give, you know, feedback, I just think it's got huge implications that um, I'm actually excited about. You have the last question. So this question is for Leslie and Vicki. Uh, if the expert in the video game is outside the classroom and is not the teacher, mm. and this Steam model becomes really successful, mm. and we have multiple games with multiple blended content, how does the teacher become accountable when the assistant principal comes in and asks, what are all your kids doing, and can we answer the question about the portal game or the railroad sim, or how does Skyrim teaching chemistry, and these kids are five levels into the game, and the expertise is outside the room. <laughs> I don't even know if you should answer. Just that moan was great. <laughs> that 
That was incredible. Mm. Um, okay, so <laughs> this is a whole other panel on what are we assessing, what are we looking for, what's effective, what is learning, are we asking the right questions, and I think what it comes down to is are those students going to be able to articulate what they have learned and what good, good skills answer. they are gaining, and the teacher, the teacher's not going to be the expert. We know that. We've heard that for three days, is that for, and you know, I'm not the expert in my household and I work for a game company. My teenage sons are the experts. And these kids, the teacher will be the coach and the inspiration and the mentor and the facilitator. And the kids are going to have to articulate it and the teacher will have to figure out what does that portfolio mm -hmm. look like to be able to prove that they've actually mastered something and transferred knowledge. Okay. Um, my, uh, moderator, my moderator privilege leaves me with a very short question as you exit and one answer. It's a one word answer. Sorry, not a one answer. I'm tired. One word answer. Are you, what's your theory of innovation and change? Radical, incremental, other. <laughs> Sorry, what was that from the audience? I said other. <laughs> Jeez, tough audience, man. <laughs> People need prompts. Um, <laughs> I could do a play on words in here and say we would say we want it to be game changing. Oh, ouch. <laughs> no, I, I'm, no, no that's, I, I, but I mean, I'm serious. We, we, I think that we haven't been, we, I will just say from Gates, that when we started the strategy that we're in now, we weren't as revolutionary as we, as we think we now we as a country now need to be. So I think we're headed on the, you know, trying to get far more on the revolutionary radical side, Excellent. the game changing side. Excellent. Well, the, my option would be both. Sometimes <laughs> it has to be radical. In some areas you definitely need radical innovation. In some other areas it should be incremental. So it definitely it's both. Excellent. Um, I hope it will be radical. <laughs> well, everybody, I'd like to thank our panelists for coming out on this lovely Saturday morning.